Second screen. I just realized because they're different computers. <laughs> oh, I'm on my Mac and I'm bumping the side going, get across. How did I, I don't even know how I stopped it. I clicked escape on this and it stopped there. It must have just been the exact time. Oh, that's very amusing. So, uh, so there, now I understand what's going on. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, so now suppose I gave you, um, I had, I, let's do a thought experiment. I've got a big bundle of playing cards. And they're all messy and jumbled up and all hundreds of thoughts. And I give them to you and I say, yeah, take those. And I say, oh, is there a five of clubs in there? I think so. Yeah, probably, if it's a big pile. But how would you know? What would you have to do? What algorithm will he go through to, find, to tell me if there's a five of clubs in there? He'll search each single one. He'll search through each card. At what point will you be able to answer that question? When I find a five of clubs. When you find a five of clubs, you'll be able to say, yes. What, what else might happen? How can you say no? When you get to the end and it's not there. So, so let's just call that a linear search. He's just going through them in sequence. One, 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 one. Actually, probably what we do, our eyes are non-linear, aren't they? You could probably actually spread them all out on the floor and just sort of like gestalt it and sort of see if there was a five there. But let's suppose you have to be linear and just do one at a time. So uh, linear, we'll call that a linear search. Because he's obviously searching, yeah, he's searching for the five of clubs. Linear search to say yes, it's when you find it. On average, when will you find it if there's exactly one in there? Halfway, halfway. halfway through, yeah. So if we've got n cards, you'll, you'll search through n on two of them on average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's not in there, how much work is he going to do? He's going to have to do n work. He's going to have to look through n cards. It's no. Okay. Now, suppose that's not good enough. Suppose there's uh, hundreds of cards. It's not just a standard deck of 52 cards. It's like everyone's student card. And it's the end of the exam, and I've got to mark the exams. And I drop all the exam papers on the ground. And, and then a student rushes up to me while I'm staring in horror at all the exam papers strewn all over the ground and says, I can't remember if I submitted my exam paper or not. And there's like 200 exam papers there. How am I going to find it? Well, I could spend, you know, that's a real pain. Or if I just, I haven't even dropped them on the ground. That's how I file them. Yeah? I get all the exam papers, I just throw, I finish marking them, I throw them in a pile on my floor, and then someone knocks on the door and says, excuse me, I'd like to go over the exam with you, Richard. I didn't understand why I got the mark I did. And I say, sure, I'll go over the exam with you. Oh. <laughs> how long is it going to take me to find it? If, if the exam's there, it'll take me how long? And on two. What if the, I'm not even sure if the exam paper's there or not. I can't quite remember if it's in that pile or another pile. I'm going to have to search for that whole pile. It's a waste of time. Now, even worse than linear search, or you could say even better than linear search, is random search. Yes. Monte Carlo search. I just pull one out. Is it it? No, throw it back. Pull one out, throw it back. <laughs> on average, how long will it take me to find it? That's a hard question. But it's probably half. You know, we get the sense it's probably a half. But, but they could take much, much, much longer. Couldn't it? Uh, no, I mean, it can't be quicker than this can be quicker. They can, both, they can both give it to me straight away. The best case is the same for both of them. The worst case is different for random search. The average case is probably um, similar. OK, so let's not consider random search. Suppose uh, student after student knocks on my door asking to look at their exam paper. And after a while, I'm getting cross that it's taken me so long to find the exam papers. What might I do? Sort them into order by name or student number. Uh, let's call that uh, search a sorted list. Now, you guys tell me, if I'm going through them one at a time, how long is it going to take me to find your exam paper? One at a time. The same amount on average. On average, you missed a mmm. And it's going to take me in on two. But where's the speed up? No, I suppose I can't jump to it at the moment. I, I know I can, but let's suppose I can't do that. Someone was saying. But finding someone, I reckon, is still going to take N on two. I, I find the no sooner. Yeah, because there's a right spot for everyone. So when I pass the right spot for you, if you're not there, I know no. So on average, how long will it take me to say no? N on two. 
again, on average, I'll have to search through half of them to find your spot, and then I'll know if you're there or not. So searching a sorted list is slightly faster. If I wanted to make searching a sorted list super fast, what sort of cheaty way can I do make it super fast? What? what? Binary search. Okay, binary search works like this. And binary search is what you do. Someone would come in, suppose it's sorted by student number, and I have no information about the order of student numbers or how they're distributed, and you tell me your student number. I will probably, what would you do? What would you do if I came in? I said, you're my person to find the exam papers. I'm going to give you a bonus so you can find them really quick. And someone comes in and says, my student number 724963521. Oh, you can't look in the computer, you've just got this pile of papers. And they're sorted, though, by student number. Go halfway. Go halfway. You'd look halfway. That number's bigger than the student number you're looking for. So what do you do? Halfway, again. halfway in the first half. The halving interval. Halve the interval each time. Does that make sense? Like, um, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100, and you can ask me questions, a yes, no question. Do you say, is it 1? No. Is it 2? No. Is it 3? No. Is it 4? No. What questions do you ask instead? Is it bigger than 50? Yes. Yes. Is it smaller than 100? No, you know it's smaller than 100 because it's between 1 and 100. What's that? Oh, no, sorry. I, so it's a number between 50 and 100. Sorry, what? It's a number between 50 and 100. You're trying to guess what it is? Is it less than 70? Is it less than 70? Because so, we're going to go halfway through the interval. Do you see that? It makes, it makes sense to sort of pick exactly halfway through the interval. And I'd say yes. Is it bigger than 90? No, it's, uh, between, it's, so far it's between 50 and 75. <laughs> Come on, 62 and a half. Is it bigger or less than 62 and a half? And, and so on and so on and so on. That's halving the interval each time. Does everyone see that? How many times if I halve the interval each time, how many questions am I going to have to ask till I get to the, to the thing I want? Seven will do it, will it, if I've got the numbers between one and 100? Let's see. I've got one and 100. So my first question is, breaks them into groups of size 50. My second question breaks them into groups of 25. My third question narrows it down, so it's either going to be 12 or 13. Well, let's pick the worst case. Let's suppose I pick the 13 one. My next question is going to narrow it down into a 6 or a 7. Let's suppose it's the worst case, 7. My next question is going to break it down into a 3 and a 4. Let's suppose it's a 4. My next question is going to break it down to a range of 2. And my last question is going to break it into a range of 1. How many questions did I have to ask? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven questions. Isn't it miraculous? These guys just knew that without writing it out. Have they memorized all possible answers to variants of this question? Yes. <laughs> Hopefully not. What's that? They're confederates. They're confederates. Line them up against the wall. No. How, how did we work it out? Well, it, essentially what we're doing is halving each time. I've sort of showed you the doubling game. You know about how to double each time. This is the halving game. You halve each time. How many times can you halve something until you get back to one? That's sort of asking the same question is, if you start with one and you double it a certain number of times, how big can you get? The answer is, was that, someone called it out, log n. Log to the base 2 of n. That's not fancy math. That's the definition of what we're trying to do. That's what log to the base 2 is. How many times do you have to raise some, what power do you have to raise 2 to <laughs> to get to the number we're after? How many times do you have to double to get to that number? So if I said, oh, I've got 1,024 possible student exam papers. How many times am I going to have to, how many searches am I going to have to do? Ten. Ten searches, because two to the ten is 1,024. Okay. Now notice, that's pretty neat. If I can do a, uh, that was a linear search of a sorted list. If I can do a binary search, then to get to the right spot takes me log to the base 2 of n. And if, once I'm at that spot, I'll know if it's there or not. Log to the base 2 of n. Now, what's the difference between log to the base 2 of n and n on 2? Well, if you're searching small numbers of things, who cares? They're very, very similar. If I'm searching eight things, one way I've got to do four comparisons, one way I've got to do three comparisons. Who cares? It's not worth it. This is a whole lot of extra work to do this dividing. What's that? What's that? Oh, why is it base n? Uh, oh, that's a very fancy piece of math that you guys are just too young to understand. So I'll, I'll write it this way for now. 
Yeah, clearly you weren't able to understand that very elaborate uh, thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a logonometric identity. You know logonometrics? <laughs> I think I fooled him. Okay, um, I got away with that. So uh, binary search is log to the base 2. Let's just look at some examples of log to the base 2 so you can see the difference between uh, log to the base 2 of n and n on 2. Let's pick some n's. Uh, if n is 8, log to the base 2 is 3, n on 2 is 4. Okay, so it's a slight saving work. If n is um, 1024, I have to do 10 bits of work versus 512 bits of work. If n is um, a million, well, I have to do 20 bits of work versus 500,000 bits of work. So you can see the binary search is really cool. Does that make sense? Right, now, binary search only works if the data is in a sorted list. Binary search of an unsorted list is completely hopeless. If I give you the exam papers in random order, they're just in random order, and you, pull, you open it halfway through, and you get a student number that's greater than the one you're looking for, does that tell you which pile they're in? No, no you've still got to search both piles. So it doesn't help you at all. So you've got to have the stuff sorted. Producing a sorted list can be a bit of a pain, though. Suppose I've got a list and I want to stick something into the list and I want to make it so keep it sorted. So my operations on the list are going to be insert and delete. How much does it cost me to stick something in the list? If I'm, it's nothing at all if I'm inserting it at the beginning, but if I'm inserting it at the beginning, I'm not creating a sorted list. If I'm inserting and I want to insert it into the right spot, I'm going to have to move along the list till I hit the right spot, one at a time. That's a pain. How far along the list on average am I have to going to go? N on two. Yeah, so inserts... On a, on an, if I, to have a sorted list, this has to be on a sorted list. Uh, oh, can you binary search where you've got to insert it? Well, only if it's in an array, not if it's in a list. Does everyone understand the difference between a list and an array? If you've got an array, you can go directly to any element you want. That's really cool. With a list, you have to tundle along the whole list. But if you've got an array, let's suppose we've whacked everyone into an array. And you discover you've got to insert it. You've got, already you've got a million items in the array. And I'm giving you the million and first item. And you discover it goes here. You do binary search to work out where it's got to go. Now you know where you've got to insert it. Now what do you have to do? Move everyone along one. How does that make you feel? Very annoyed. So the bottom one has to come one. and You've even got to do it backwards, which is annoying. You're not even counting forwards through a loop. You've got to have a... Minusy thing going on. That's very annoying. So you, everything's going to move down one. You're going to have to do half a million bits of work to insert it. Oh, and if you delete someone, then you're going to have to move everyone back up. So obviously, inserting and deleting an array is horrible. But inserting and deleting in a linked list, that's horrible too. Because although the actual insertion and deletion is really easy, you just break the list, get a new guy, stick him in, and reconnect the pointers, you've got to find the right spot to stick him in. And whereas you can find the right spot really quickly with an array using binary search, using a linked list, the only way to find the right spot is what? Linear search. Linear search for the whole list. So this seems very annoying. We can either use a linked list or we can use an array. And we've got finding where to stick it and then we've got sticking it. All right, here's my grid. Finding where in a linked list is horrible. Inserting it is easy. Finding where in an array is fantastical. We just do binary search. But sticking it in is horrible. What we really want to do is find out where it is as a list and then magically have it turn into an array when we stick it in. Now, no one's ever found out a way of doing that, but that would be really good if you could do that. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, looks <laughs> it looks to us like we've got two different data structures here, and neither of them are really giving us exactly what we want. And each of them are suggesting tantalizingly that speed-ups are possible, but neither of them are providing the speed-ups we want in all respects. So, instead of trying to fancy them up with fancier arrays, and you're welcome to think about that, that's a really cool thing to think about, Let's think, maybe there's another data structure. Maybe this array is missing an extra column. 
and there's some mystery data structure we can use which is super fast to find the right spot and super fast to stick it in. That would be cool. And there is such a structure. And it's based on the idea of a binary search. It's a tree. Can I show you what a tree looks like? Computing trees, trees in the real world don't actually quite look right. Because, yeah, trees in the real world look like this, if you've ever seen them. They've got a trunk which comes up, and then it splits into two, and then branches come off it at various times. Can you see? It, does this look abhorrent to you? It's, that's why Marrickville Council chops down every tree it can. Because <laughs> what's the matter with them? They're, They're upside down. <laughs> Clearly trees should not look like that. A, a tree, as any computer scientist knows, starts at the top and goes down like this. What about the roots? Well, under this guy's the roots come out like this. And they... No, I see what you're saying. I see, that's an interesting thing. So we could call this like roots rather than... Uh, well, it's part of the tree. That's interesting, actually. Now I think about it. What is a tree? Oh, let's not even go there. <laughs> that's crazy data structure. Yeah, whoever suggested that might be uh, just about to solve some amazing new problem that we haven't thought about. OK, now technically, actually, it is a, any graph that doesn't have cycles in it is called a tree. So even if it did go back up like that, it would still be called a tree. But the standard tree we're going to use in computer science is going to have two-way forking at every level. We're going to try and line the levels up to make it neat. And that means we're going to call it a binary tree. Binary here just means it's splitting in half. It's splitting into two at every point. So, and we're going to call these dudes here, the splitting points, exactly what they're called, actually, in biology. We're going to call them nodes. Does that make sense? So a node, like an array, you sort of think of as a, a, a grid of, of buckets, and you can put things in the buckets. And a linked list is like a chain of buckets, and you can put things in the buckets. So each of them has a structure, a shape, the way it's laid out, in a grid or in a long chained line. And they also have contents that you can insert in. Well, I've drawn here the structure of a tree, and where do you think you stick the contents in? At the nodes. So every node will contain a value. So if this is a tree of ints, there'll be a number here and 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 a number here. And how do we know when we get to the end? Well, just like a list, we have to have some sort of terminator to say we've reached the end. But we're going to have lots of terminators down here. The terminators here, by the way, are called leaf nodes, because obviously the leaves. And, uh, and, and the terminator is probably going to be null. So when we get to the end, there'll be like a, a null. Uh, let's, how will I draw that? Uh, we'll say. I won't draw another node underneath, I'll just draw crosses. And you can see each, each node at the bottom has to have two leaf nodes, two nulls, because each node has what we call two children. So we, we actually use like descendant terminology here. So this is a parent node of these two child nodes, and all the nodes under here are descendants of that node, and that node is an ancestor of all of these nodes. Can you see this? And every parent has two, child, two children, or it could have one child, or it could have no child. OK, so this is our structure for a tree. Now, why is a tree going to be neat before we can think about how we'd even go about representing it? Well, a tree is going to be neat if we do the following sort of thing. Uh, a tree is going to be neat because it's going to let us create a unique spot. Remember, we had this problem that we needed to be able to create unique spots for people. Everyone has a unique spot where they go. You get a new student number. There's one place in the list where it's supposed to go. We have to find that spot, and then we have to sort of create a, make a hole there and stick it in. Yep. So we're going to have to somehow find a spot, and all the spots we're going to find are going to be at the bottom, so we're going to have to do a bit of work to get to the spot. But how much work do we have to do to get to the bottom of a tree? Log in. Log in. Yeah, if it's splitting in half every time, then if the tree's got 1,000 nodes at the bottom, it's 10 steps down to get it. So we're going to get to these vacant spots at the bottom, and you can see there's lots of them, all the ones with X's in. We can get to them really fast. And we can insert in them really quickly because they're already empty. They're vacant. They're just sitting there now waiting for something to go in. So insertion's no cost at all. So it's going to be nice. It's going to be a log n finding and a, a linear a constant insert. OK. So let's have some numbers. So can someone think of some random numbers? Could you want to just fire off a sequence of uh, 10 random numbers between 1 and 100? 5, 6, 
Hey, hey, these random. So don't make them sorted. Okay, 11, 42, 3, 1, 16, one, we're doing it again, 1, 2, 3, see it just happens without us planning, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, oh you want to put another 1 in, oh let's not have duplicates yet, 93, negative 1, 2, 9, 9, that's 10? Okay, let's go. All right, here's our sequence of things. Now, I'm going to insert them into a tree. Shh, shh. We'll see how a tree insertion works. Initially, my tree is empty. The root node, there's just, there's nothing. That's my empty tree. I'm going to insert the five. Where do I stick it? Stick it at the top. So number five goes here. Now, number five has two potential children, but at the moment, they're both empty. And I've processed number five. Who do I stick in next? Six. Where does six go? The right-hand side. I'm going to say any children that are bigger than the parent go on the right. Any children that are smaller than the parent go on the left. So I'm going to stick six in here. And that's no longer a cross. That's now an arrow pointing down to here. And six is going to have two crosses. All right, now where am I going to stick the 11? Right-hand side of the six. Oh, it is looking a bit like a list, isn't it? That's a pain. It's because we, at the moment, just inserting them in order. If you're inserting them in order, a list is as fast as you'd ever want anyway. 42. Whew, just going down. 42. Three. Where does the three go? Three goes down here. Okay. Where does the one go? Oh, you guys aren't... Look at this. It's revealing that there's not as much randomness as we'd like to think. You're creating just two lists. Ah, 16. That was good. Now that's craziness. Okay. Where does 16 go? Well, let's start at number five. Is 16 bigger or smaller than 5? So which way do I go down? Bigger or smaller than 6? Bigger or smaller than 11? Bigger or smaller than 42? Smaller. Oh. This is a bit of a fragile part of structure now. Uh, okay, 93, where does that go? To the right of 42. We go do, 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 down to 42. It's bigger than 42, so it goes down here. Oh, 93. Yep, that's what I meant. Yes. Always get those two numbers mixed up. Uh, and then 2, where does that go? No, it doesn't. Let's start at the top. 5, bigger or smaller? 3, bigger or Oh, you're right. Sorry. 3, bigger or smaller? Smaller. I thought it was going to be bigger, but it's smaller than three. But, but it's bigger than one, so it goes down here. That's right. And who have we got left now? Nine. nine. Where does nine go? Hopefully that will give us a bit of complexity. Bigger than five, bigger than six, but smaller than 11. Now, if you play this game of inserting things, and I encourage you to practice it yourself at home, you'll soon learn that there's precisely one spot to put every element when you come across it. And the tree always has the property that the tree is a recursive structure. The tree is either empty or it's got a value and it's got two child trees. And it always has this nice property that all the values in the left child tree are smaller than the parent and all the values in the right child tree are bigger than the parent. So if you're searching, you always get to this nice splitting in half thing. You can pick, it's not in that pile because everyone in that pile is bigger and I need a smaller one. So it straight away tells you this pile. Does that make sense? So it gives you the binary um, uh, in search. And it also got uh, a linear insert, because when you get to the bottom, you just insert by just creating a new node, which you just need a new pointer for. So. If you insert them in order, you get, yeah, that's sort of what I was um, thinking about next. The order in which you insert them will give you a different tree. If you insert them randomly, you'll get a random looking tree. And on average, that'll be what we call a balanced tree. It'll be sort of roughly filled in with the, roughly the, you know, filled in at every level and so on and so on. But if you put them in in a pathologically bad way, like all in normal order or all in reverse order, you'll just get this enormous long degenerate list. Trees have this nice property of being fast to look up only when they're balanced or roughly balanced. The more they degenerate towards a list, the worse their performance is. So yeah, if you stuck them in in order, then this isn't going to give you any speed up at all. And there are neat algorithmic techniques for dealing with that. 
So you, that's not a problem at the moment. But yeah, in fact, in the next course you do, 1, 9, 2, 7, you will spend an enormous amount of the course dealing with this problem of what happens when my trees aren't balanced. Everything is magic when they're balanced, but my trees keep losing their balance and they start growing long fronds one way and not in other directions. Yeah, I mean, there are things called pruning. Yeah, how do I deal with my tree when it becomes unbalanced? And th there are clever ways for dealing with that and rebalancing trees or doing various things so you don't need to rebalance the trees. And they're very, very clever. And they're important because if, the, if your tree gets unbalanced, it's linear. If your tree's balanced, it's logarithmic speed to look up. Yeah. Now, what happens if you have a duplicate? That's a good question. What do you guys think? What happens if you have a duplicate element in your list of data going in? Not try and see, because, oh, you yeah, try and see what I do. <laughs> but I want you to guess what I'm going to do. Yeah. What if you were to define each node as being a struct in each Yeah, node? that's one way of doing it. Yeah. One way of doing it is each node could just count how many times you've seen that guy. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. In this case, that would work because we just need to know if five's in there or not. But if five has another piece of data associated with it, like it's your student number, but attached to that is the exam paper, then... I can't add all the exam papers together. Th then we have to do some other ancillary data structure. Yeah, or another way? Could you just funnel down further? So go yep. to the three and then go to the Just funnel further. So you just make a decision where you say, if they're equal, I'll always insert on the left. Or if they're equal, I'll always insert on the right. Or you say something like that. You've just got to have it. So when you get to a node, there's no question about which way you go. Oh, I guess you could say stick it on the left or right, I don't care. But then if you find an equal one, you've got to search down both sides for a while. That's a bit of a pain. It's probably better to say always put it on the left or always put it on the right. And if you get too many equal values and that makes your tree biased towards the left or the right, you could say things like, oh, I'll put odd numbers when they're equal will go to the left and even numbers when they're equal will go to the right. Or you think of something so it sort of ends up being more balanced. Yeah, yeah, so you've got to work out some way of doing that where there's no bias. This is part of the art of balancing your tree. But yeah, essentially you can stick the data in there as a separate cell. The two options are, or you can augment the structure at the node to have summary information for all of those guys. Could you have a third leg for equals? Uh, could you have a third leg for equals? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's augmenting the structure at the node. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of what Joseph was suggesting too, but I didn't repeat out loud what he said. Yeah, you could have another chain coming off here of all the guys that are equal, that's fine. And that would be then a ternary tree. Ternary means it's got three things. Yeah. yeah. Or it, it wouldn't even have to have the same status as a normal child. It could just be a separate list. So you say, I've got to the three, now I've got a list of all the things that are three. There are lots of ways of doing it. Essentially, when things are equal, it's just a small trivial housekeeping problem. You can solve it in lots of ways, but it doesn't affect the fundamental structure of a tree. So normally when we're doing examples, we leave the equals cases out so they don't clutter things up. Now, are there any more questions about the general structure of what you've seen? Because I now want to code it in C. But I want to make sure you understand the structure, because the coding... No point doing the coding if you don't understand what we're trying to do. So let me just have a look around the room. There's, there's really no questions? Everyone's got the tree thing? All right, to check you've got the tree thing, everyone get your pad and paper out. I want you to insert these following numbers into a tree. Oh, this reminds me of a fun game, actually, that we should teach you one day. Because I'm going to find a, a, some money, if I've got some and use it to generate my random numbers. Does someone have some money that I can have? <laughs> a note. Any, any note. Do you have a note? Yeah, I believe I do. I, I promise I will give it back. There's a, you've got to remind me there's a very fun game we can play with notes and using them as random number generators. Oh, 50? Oh, man, give me, write your student number on that and you're set. <laughs> oh, no, look, she's looking at me disapprovingly. Uh, She's, who is she? Edith? Oh no, she's even named off my own child. I can't, while well, an Edith is staring at me, take a bribe. But I can now. Oh no, I can't. Oh no, it's a sad looking Aboriginal man. I want, is there one with a rapacious, evil looking person on it? I could do that. All right, so here's your number. Everyone get ready. Insert these numbers in your binary tree. On your marks, because I'm just going to use the serial numbers on the note. Shh, 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 uh, So, um, uh, 13. Uh, it's a D. I'm trying to convert it to numbers. Uh, e, D, uh, 13. E, F, G, 313. 16. 9. 8. 2. 8. 
9, 5, 6, 3. Thank you very much. All right, so build your tree. Without looking at mine, I'm just going to draw what I think it should look like. Well, should we say equal numbers go to the left or the right? You, you, you pick your own convention. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll say to the right, um, just because I'm nervous about this whole liberal thing. So let's say whenever we have a choice, we move to the right. Uh, so we're going to say, uh, uh, oh, oh, that's not going to work. Bigger numbers go to the right. 16. And 9 is smaller than 13, so that goes there. And uh, 8 is smaller than 13, and it's smaller than 9, so it goes there. And 2 is smaller than 13, smaller than 9, smaller than 8, so it goes here. Another degenerate tree. And another 8, uh, so 13, uh, smaller than 13, smaller than 9, but equal to 8, so it goes down here. Uh, 9 again, oh, okay. It's uh, smaller than 13, but it's equal to 9, so it goes down there. Um, 5 is smaller than 13, smaller than 9, smaller than 8, but bigger than 2, so it goes down there. 6 is um, smaller than 13, smaller than 9, smaller than 8. Oh, this is hopeless, this way of doing it, isn't it? There's, there's never ever going to be anything going down there, is there? Hopeless, hopeless. It's going to mark up the balance of my tree. But anyway, um, sh sh let's not worry about duplicates. Uh, eight, what am I inserting? A five? So and I've inserted the five, I'm inserting now what, a six? Oh, that's bigger than two and, oh, bigger, oh. Okay, that's tricky. Ah. And then last one we're inserting is a three. Uh, which is smaller than 13, smaller than 9, smaller than 8, bigger than 2, but smaller than 5. Ta-da! And that's our tree. Not superly balanced, but it's a tree. Who drew that? <laughs> well done, I did. Yes, that's, I hope you all drew something similar, or if you insert it to the left, the other way. Now, I'm sorry, I've lost your $50 note. hope that's okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Right, now how are, we going to insert, how are we going to do that in C? Well, does this sort of look a bit familiar? It's not completely unfamiliar, is it? It's a bit like stuff we've been doing in C. These circles look a bit like those dominoes that we were drawing. They look like nodes, don't they? But how are they different to a node? They have, they have uh, what, three different values in each one rather than two. A node had a number and a pointer to the next. This one appears to have, it's a pie, it appears to have a, a pizza, a delicious pizza. Uh, it appears to have a two, a number, and it has what? Two pointers to nodes. Can you see that? So we can say something like struct tree node. And it's going to have int value and it's going to have a, 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 I'm going to write it as a tree to the left and a tree to the right. So one tree called left and one tree called right where a tree is type def a point, it's a pointer to a struct tree node. Struct tree node. It's not abstract, so I'll do it lowercase. Does that make sense? So a tree is a pointer to one of these structs. And a struct simply contains a number and pointers to two more of those structs. When we create one, whenever we create a node, we'd better make sure we set these two guys to null. That's a child at the bottom. That's putting the little crosses in. And we stick a value in here. And if you needed to go down the left, you just create malloc a new tree node. 
and store the um, pointer to that in left, if you're going down the left, or malloc and neutrinode and store the pointer to that down to the right if you're going to the right. Yes. Oh, I should know your name and I've forgotten it. Sash. Sash. Yeah. yeah. Alexander or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can augment the struct with extra information to do it with duplicates, sure. And there's lots of ways of doing that. I don't, I don't want to go down that path because there's lots of different ways of doing it and everyone has different merits in different times. Let's just notice that we have to deal with it in some way. Yeah. Yes. Do you hear what, everyone was, what he was saying? I should just repeat it because it was good. It's, I, I like the way you guys are thinking about the difficult problem. The difficult problem you've all seen now is, oh, gee, how are we going to handle it when they're the same? And I'm trying to be coy about it and not really say how to do it because there are lots of ways of doing it and the merits of them all vary and I don't really want to get into the details of that. I don't really care what you do. However you do to deal with it will be absolutely fine with me. You could keep inserting them into the tree or you could stick extra values in here to, to store the duplicates in some way. You could keep them in an array or have a list of them or just a count of how many there are if that's all you need or, or whatever. Yep. So, yep. Yes? Ah, would a child ever need to know its parents? That's an amusing thing about trees. Normally the children don't know their parents and the parents know their children. And that's just like real life. <laughs> uh, no, no, not adoption. Just I don't think you ever really know what your parents are like because you just think of them as these units. And it's very hard to think that they're people that were loving and dancing and singing and had hopes and dreams and joys. And you just think of them as people that tidy the house and do your washing for you and things like that. But they know you so well, I realise looking at my own children, I know them so well that when they're 20, Gwen will do something and I'll just know everything about her and she'll just say something and I'll think, she's telling a fib and, da -da -da -da, and she'll do all these things later in life and to her she'll think they're completely new and unsurprised and I, I know exactly how her character is now, I think. Well, I, I think that because I'm her parent. So, uh, yeah, and, but of course my parents know nothing about me, I should say. It's not that they have any insight into what I'm really like that I don't have. No, 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 but I certainly know about Gwen. So I think uh, certainly there is this one directional nature. And notice we had this same nature to our linked lists, that our linked lists only went one way. And if we didn't, weren't careful and kept a tra track of where we started, we could never go back. And then I mentioned you could have doubly linked linked lists, where they do have each node has a parent going, uh, pointer going back. You could do that. And of course you could have doubly linked trees, where each child has a parent to its pointer. But it turns out, whoever asked the question, wave at me. It turns out, and I should know your name and I've forgotten it. You're Alex. Okay, Alex. I know because you were sick and we've talked a couple of times. Is that you? Didn't I give you a DVD? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that wasn't because you were sick? Uh, no. Oh, I gave it to the wrong person then. No, no, no. I gave it to you. Okay. Oh, you had something? Okay. All right. Don't tell me. Complicated backstory. Yeah. Um, uh, it turns out that, thank you, <laughs> that it turns out that... Um, you rarely need, do need to go back. You normally write your programs so they just go down. You rarely ever need to go back up. You rarely start off with a pointer to a child and need to find a parent. You normally just have a pointer to the start of the tree and from that you find everything you need. And because it's so quick to travel down the tree, it's only log n time, you don't really need pointers into the middle of the tree. What if you wanted to remove something? Ah, how do you remove from a tree? That's an interesting question. Oh, you're jumping ahead to advanced questions. No, don't be sorry. That's really good. Um, can I say, this is not part of this lecture, but let me just say, let me give you a, a puzzle for how you might do it. Or do you want me to leave it as a puzzle for you to think about and I'll talk about it next lecture? Why don't I do that? Think about how you can delete. And just think about why I'm going, ooh, that's interesting. Because it turns out deleting's slightly diff more difficult than inserting. It's only slightly. You can work it out. But you have to answer one more question that you don't have to answer when you insert. So you guys think about how you might do deleting. Okay. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you next. If it's not in the Tudor Labs this week, I'll show you next week. Or next lecture. I'm assuming already I'm not coming on Wednesday, but let's hope that I will. Adoption comes into it. Adoption comes into it. Oh, yeah, or the grandparents having to uh, look after the kids after. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit sad deletion. I don't like, I don't, we won't go there. <laughs> yes. yes. Now, now, without talking about any more sad things, I had two things that I want to do before we get to the end of the lecture. One is, shh, I do want to show you some books that I um, think uh, would be useful for you to get. One is uh, Raymond Smullyan, who's a famous mathematician, really cool guy, a logician. He wrote this book called Forever Undecided, A Puzzle Guide to Girdle. And it's a book just full of little puzzles. And as you go through the whole book, at the end of this, you'll have learned propositional calculus, which is what we started at the beginning of today's lesson, 
which is like A and B and that sort of thing. It's called propositional calculus. Calculus because you can calculate with it, though it's pretty simple. And propositional because it's all about propositions. They're your atoms in it. Uh, using propositional calculus, he does all sorts of fun little tricks and games and you read through the book and without knowing it, by the time you get to the end, you've learnt the most profound bit of mathematics ever called Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem, which is just so cool that makes your toes curl. And uh, it has lots of fun puzzles like knights and knaves and so on and so on and so on and so on. And so on. Uh, then there's uh, Richard Feynman. Now, he's a really cool guy, and the science show's been talking about him a bit recently. So I thought I'd mention that everyone should definitely read the book. Oh, I brought the wrong one. Don't read this book. <laughs> read, read a book by the same guy. I even got it out. I just put the, wrong, put the one on my bag. All these books are fantastic. He's a brilliant physicist who's an amazing character. And there's a book called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Has anyone read that? Yes. And what do you think? It is just unbelievable. He's this very clever physicist, a brain the size of a planet, and this is just his personal biography where he chats about some of the things he's done in his life. And it actually makes you cry so much. It's so funny. One of the things is he was at Los Alamos where they were developing the atomic bomb and they had all these stupid bureaucratic security restrictions. And he, all his letters to his wife were censored. They used to censor it. They'd read the letter and he was really outraged that they used to do this and just randomly take out bits in case he was leaking secrets about the atom bomb. So what he did was he bought a big jigsaw puzzle, a huge one with like a million pieces, and he assembled it and wrote the message, a letter to his wife on the back and then jumbled it up and posted it to her. So they had to actually reassemble the entire <laughs> message. And that's, that's called the, the work ratio. You want to make the bad guys do more work, so that's very cool. Um, or, you know, what he could have done is just written it on a plate and smashed the plate. They'd have had to reassemble a plate on the off chance his wife was going to. <laughs> that would be very funny. Um, yeah, yeah, you can shred it. And there's funny stories about shredders being reconstructed, but let's not go down there. Another one last funny thing he did was he discovered an exit hole in the fence where you could get out without the guards seeing you. So he freaked out there. They did this complicated logging system where they log people coming in and going out. And he did this thing where he'd go in and log in and say hi, then creep out through the fence, and then he'd sign in again. Hi, just following the right. <laughs> Kept doing that. That was really cool. Oh, and the last one. Some really, uh, he was, he's just renowned for being amazingly clever. And so uh, a Chinese girl came up to him at a party and just said, <laughs> and without missing a beat, he looked back at her and went, <laughs> back. And she said, oh, damn, he knows Cantonese. I only speak Mandarin. <laughs> but actually, he was just making random Chinese-like sounds. But he just pulled off the bluff because he's so cool. So you should read this book. It's awesomely good. No, not that book. Not that book. Don't read that book. That's, that's no good. Uh, and, uh, Auden, and the last one I want to show you is Alice's Adventures in Wonderglass. Uh, the Wonderglass. <laughs> Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I was talking about steganography, and there's lots of cool stuff hidden in this. Uh, you probably know about it, or you may or may not know about it. It's written by a brilliant mathematician from Cambridge. It's absolutely packed with hidden stuff. And the really cool thing is, like, for example, in Through the Looking Glass, every person she meets, she's a pawn in a chess game, Every chapter, or every time she meets someone, she's actually making a move, and she meets knights and bishops and things. And you can actually play the game out that she's engaged in. Like, the whole book is actually a game, and it finishes with her reaching the eighth rank, becoming a queen and checkmating the opponent. But you can read the whole book and not realise that it's a chess game. You're... It's just very, very clever. And the reason I brought this is I wanted to read you a little poem out of here, which is... And there was a hand up. Who was waving the hand? Yeah. Can you chuck a list of all your favourite books on the window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should chuck a list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, there's a really good version of Alice, by the way, called the Annotated Alice. I didn't bring it today, but it's annotated by Martin Gardner, who's a really clever guy. And, he, and the, I love it because when you get it, it's got notes on every page of Alice in Wonderland. And like, it'll be like one, pa one paragraph of Alice in Wonderland, one page of notes. This is so amazing. But uh, what I wanted to show you was the song. The song. Where's the song? The song... A sitting on a gate. Oh, it's my own invention. 243. <coughs> she meets this knight, who's actually conjectured to be Carol himself or Dodson. <laughs> and he's going to sing her a song. And. Ah, oh, here it is. We've got a second? Can, do I have two minutes? Yes. yes? All right, here we go. Uh, he's going to read the song. Alice doesn't really want to hear it. Uh, is it very long, Alice asked, because she'd heard a great deal of poetry that day already. Oh, it is long, said the knight, but it's very, very beautiful. Everyone that hears me sing it, either it brings tears into their eyes or else... Or else what, said Alice, for the knight had made a sudden pause. Oh, or else it doesn't. 
Um, the name of the song, so he's like a binary logic sort of way. The name of the song is Haddock Size. The name of the, oh sorry, the name of the song is called Haddock Size. Oh, is that the name of the song, is it? Said Alice, trying to feel interested. No, no, you don't understand, said the knight, looking a little vexed. That's what the name is called. The name really is The Aged Aged Man. Oh, then I ought to have said, that's what the song is called, Alice corrected herself. No, you oughtn't. That's quite another thing. The song is called Ways and Means, but that's only what it's called, you know. Well, what is the song then, said Alice, who was by this time completely bewildered. I was coming to that, the knight said. The song really is a sitting on a gate. And then he sings a song, which is an awesome song. So that is, of course, the confusion between the label and the thing. Yeah, yeah? She's talking about what the name is called, and then she's talking about what the name is. But actually, she wants to know what the song is. That's very cool. All right, uh, and that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I'll catch up with you. Oh, oh no, sorry, I did have one quick thing just to congratulate Theo. Where are you, Theo? Theo showed me a solution to the Josephus problem the other day that is, was so beautiful. It was just amazing. And Except the wiki had a better solution. The wiki might have a better solution. I don't care. You work that one out. And I, I thought afterwards, I might have even said it to Theo, it's seeing things like that that make teaching all worthwhile. It was just really, it was so beautiful. So well done. It was an awesome piece of code. So well done to Theo. We'll post his code next week so everyone can see how beautiful it was. Well done. Okay, everyone go. Go, go, go. Well done. That's good. Yes. With the new microprocessor. Yeah.